Since the only king I mean to bend my knee to. The king of the north! The king of the north! There's a little bit of Edward IV and Rob too. You know, Rob is in some ways the early Edward IV. Treason. You're summoned to King's Landing to swear fealty to the new king. After Richard of York is killed, his teenage son, Edward, becomes the, the Duke of York and leads his armies and wins several victories over the Lancasters while still a teenager and a very young man. His grace summons me to King's Landing, I'll go to King's Landing. But not alone. Call the banners. Edward IV, or the future Edward IV, is still only 18 years old. Young guy. He's passionate, impulsive, and a brilliant military commander. He was never defeated on the field of battle. And Tywin Lannister's whole problem with Robb Stark is he keeps winning. Stark won't risk marching on Casterly Rock until he's at full force. He's a boy and he's never lost a battle. He'll risk anything at any time. And of course, like Rob, Edward married unwisely to a woman he met while on campaign. I don't want to marry the Frey girl. The difference between Rob Stark and Edward IV is Edward IV successfully overthrows Henry VI and becomes king, where Rob Stark gets killed at the Red Wedding. The Red Wedding, man, it's the iconic episode, right? It's almost too crazy to be true, except George has said he was taking his inspiration from real history. George R. R. Martin has taken several different events, specifically drawing from Scottish history, and mixed them up together to create the Red Wedding. Scottish history is uh, an amazing source for all of this because it's one of the most incredibly bloody histories of any country that I've ever, ever studied. He was looking at the Black Dinner of 1440, held at the court of the boy king, James II of Scotland. The Black Dinner occurred when the king of Scotland was having a, a dispute with the Black Douglases. The Lord of Douglas was a young man, 18 or 19 years old, kind of a Rob Stark figure and uh, he brought his even younger brother with him and they had a marvelous feast and everybody was having a great old time. But then when the feast was over, a single drum began to play, just boom, boom, boom. Men rushed in, grabbed the Earl and his brother, dragged him outside and beheaded them. Now, the other half of it, of course, was the Glencoe Massacre, which was uh, a few centuries later. And the Campbells came to the town of Glencoe, which was a McDonald town, and they, they stayed overnight with the McDonald's. But there were these laws of hospitality in Scotland that were very time-honored and obeyed, just as in Westeros. The McDonald's fed the Campbells, and they gave them water, and they gave them shelter from the storm. And then in the middle of night, their guests rose up from their beds and started killing every McDonald they could get their hands on. You know, guests slaughtering their hosts. In the case of the Red Wedding, I reversed that. The Lannisters and their regards. It's those two incidents I blended together to make the Red Wedding. I'm a brother of the Night's Watch. I don't know what I have left to give you. You can give me the North. Even if I wanted to, I'm a bastard. The snow. Kneel before me. Lay your sword at my feet. Pledge me your service and you'll rise again as John Stark, Lord of Winterfell. I think Westeros is set in a feudal society. Ask Jon Snow if this is a feudal world. He's going to tell you, of course it is. He's a bastard. He's born outside it. It's king-led. There are noble houses. The idea of your birthright is, is potent. The firstborn heir, male heir, is the most important person. So Rob Stark is the most important person in the Stark family. In the very first episode, you see the Stark children lining up to greet Robert Baratheon. Well, they're lined up in order of age and gender. So Rob Stark, who's the oldest boy, is first. Then Sansa is second. Arya is third, but she's late, and Bran is standing in her place, and she shoves him out of the way because she's the one that's supposed to be there. 
So in that, that very basic sense, we're talking about an aristocratic world in which your birth is, in a sense, your destiny. Yes, Westeros is a feudal system, although it's a feudal system, of course, complicated by white walkers and dragons. I did not go full feudal, <laughs> but I have a, a quasi-feudal system where there are landed knights and lords who have castles who swear fealty to the king. So there's this network of, of obligations. You have lower lords like Eddard Stark's vassals in the north. All those high lords, they all thought they were better than me. Ned Stark, Hoster Tully. People like Roose Bolton, who kind of chafe a little that they have to bend the knee. No more Starks to bow and scrape to. Must have been torture following that stupid boy all over the country. He ignored my advice at every turn. That relationship of having to serve a lord, an overlord, militarily, as well as support them in other matters, was very common in the Middle Ages.